Hey guys, welcome, it's Mr Matt Paul and today we're going to talk about early threats to Elizabeth during her reign. I'm going to go through four main threats. This is going to be comprised of two different videos. I'm going to go through the first video now. So, <clears throat> Elizabeth came to the throne in 1558. She was 25 years old. She was very young, okay? She was very inexperienced. You know, 25 is very young to be a leader of a nation. You think of most of your prime ministers uh, these days, they're much older and hopefully more qualified. Anyway, so... The first threat which she faced was a threat of invasion, what we call the Ald Alliance. Now, the Ald Alliance was, in fact, an alliance between Scotland and France, and it had been set up um, in the 1200s. And really, what the Scottish and French monarchs had wanted was to really join their thrones together. If you think about it, Scotland is above England, France is below England, it had encircled England, it was really an anti-English alliance. So... This uh, threat of invasion was actually from someone called Mary of Guise. Now, Mary of Guise is a very interesting woman. Um, and if you think about it, the world was very patriarchal, very male-dominated at this point. Kings were almost always, well, kings are always going to be men. Monarchs of nations were always, uh, almost always men because of primogeniture. The firstborn son would take the throne. Now, obviously, Elizabeth uh, is anathema, is opposite to this, and this is why she's so interesting. But she had a likewise kind of correspondent in the north, so or, or Scotland, and her name was Mary of Guise. Mary of Guise was the Queen Consul of Scotland, and she had a daughter called Mary Queen of Scots, who we'll talk about later in a lot more detail on this course. But anyway, she had 9,000 troops up in Scotland, and that was a real danger. Elizabeth was very scared that she would face a, an invasion um, from these French troops in Scotland, a highly trained army, 3,000 cavalry and 6,000 infantry. We'll talk about more about this threat in my next video. Anyway, another threat was uh, religion. Catholics and Protestants. The church had been split. So you should know about the Reformation. A German monk called Martin Luther knocked on the church and he put his 95 complaints. And uh, the Catholic church was then split really into two. The Protestant, Protest Church, and the Catholic church. There was a split. And it split Europe right down the middle. And England was no different. So Elizabeth's father, King Henry VIII, had famously wanted to dissolve his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. And therefore, he required um, an annulment. And so he split and made a Church of England. This Church of England became kind of more explicitly Protestant under his son, uh, Edward, and Elizabeth. Uh, and Elizabeth's predecessor, um, Mary Tudor, is known as Bloody Mary. So you've all probably heard of that famous rumour, if you get up at three o'clock in the morning and say Bloody Mary into a mirror three times, you'll see a ghost. It's a very famous rumour. But the reason um, we ha have this rumour, and the reason that Mary's called Bloody Mary, is because she burnt 300 Protestants at the stake. And I don't mean the meaty kind, I mean a wooden stake. She burnt 300 of them doing that. And the reason she burnt Protestants is because she was a Catholic. So you have to understand there was a lot of enmity, a lot of hatred uh, between Catholics and Protestants, and this is going to dominate this section of history. If you can just get your head around the fact that Protestants and Catholics were in two opposing camps, and this dominated not only religion, but politics, and don't forget, royalty is politics at this time. So, because Catholics and Protestants hated each other, this presented a threat to Elizabeth's throne. So what did she do? She introduced the religious settlement. So instead of burning her enemies, she was a Protestant, instead of burning Catholics she put forward the Act of Uniformity, which was that everyone had to go to the Church of England. She actually made it a little bit of a halfway church between Catholicism and Protestantism. It was a Protestant church on the whole, though. Now, if you try and satisfy everyone, you end up pleasing no one. So a lot of Puritans, extreme Protestants, didn't like this, and she actually did get a lot of opposition from Catholics during her reign. But that is for another day. So she didn't quite solve this. It was an ongoing thing. But you can see that she took measures which weren't extreme, were quite reasonable, and she tried to deal with the issue. She also introduced the Act of Supremacy. And this was that she would be the supreme governess of the, of the Church of England. Unlike her father, Henry VIII called himself the, the head, the supreme head of the Church of England. So Elizabeth was trying to be less insulting towards Catholics by doing this. What she was essentially saying was, oh, I'm, I'm the governor, so I'm running it. But she wasn't trying to say I'm a direct rival of the Pope with that title. Now, another threat that she faced was her legitimacy. Now, this is really interesting. Um, Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn, well, she was de deemed a devil worshipper because she had six fingers on her left hand. And she had 
been famously accused, at least accused, of having affairs um, behind Elizabeth's father, King Henry VIII's back. And for that, she was executed as a traitor. But to really understand why a lot of Catholics thought that Elizabeth was illegitimate, you just have to understand Catholicism. Now, Catholicism uh, is based around the Bible, of course. And in the Bible, um, there's a, a very famous line. And it says, what God had, has put together, no man can separate. So this is referred to with marriage. So this is why divorce is an extreme taboo. It's not done in the Catholic Church. Still today, um, the Pope really isn't in favour of divorce. So let's not forget that Elizabeth was a child of a second marriage, and this is extremely controversial this time period. A second marriage today isn't really that controversial. No one really bat an eyelid. But at that time, in the 1500s, it just wasn't a dumb thing. So her being born of a second marriage meant that Catholics didn't recognise her as legitimate. So they called her a bastard queen, a rude word, insulting, I know. And a lot of Catholics lived in the north of England, and they just didn't consider her the rightful queen of England. They thought that Mary, Queen of Scots, should be the true Catholic queen of England. So because of that, that was a threat to her throne. Now, it was very hard for her to deal with that. It was just something that she had to kind of try... She tried to airbrush her mum out of, out of history, to be honest. She tried to rely on the fact that she was her father's daughter. So that was a kind of way that she dealt with this kind of threat to her, to her throne. But she dealt with an armed uprising, the, the Rising of the North in 1570. And um, she just became a very strong leader. I'd say that was one of the main ways to destroy a criticism. Um, now, she never married. She had no husband. And this is obviously why we study her, because she's unlike other women at the time. Now, actually, when I look at history and I think, well, in 1558... She should get married. It would secure her throne. Imagine she she married a, a strong king. But the question was, who? Who put a ring on her finger? If she married a foreigner, that would displease English lords. If she married an English lord, that meant that she wouldn't strengthen her throne by marrying a foreigner. If she married a foreigner, who would be expected to rule England? Do you see? Her life experience had really taught her that men were quite dangerous. Her own father had executed her mother. When she had uh, been adopted by a stepfather... He had been very abusive towards her. His name was Thomas Seymour. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why Elizabeth never married. But the thing is, the thing that could make her very weak by not marrying actually made her very strong. She depended on herself. She didn't need no man. Okay, she was a strong, independent woman. And you can't write that in an exam, but it's fundamentally true. It's very interesting. She developed her own mind. She was very well educated. She made her own decisions. She cut her own path. Okay? She became the supreme governing monarch of England and didn't have to rely on a patriarchal male to tell her what to do. She was intelligent enough to make rational decisions, to appoint ministers who were capable, such as Sir Francis Walsingham, for instance, who was a very great spy master. So, and obviously you have the, you have the Baron Burley, okay, who was uh, her first secretary, really like a kind of prime minister type figure. So she appointed many ministers into posts who were very capable in their roles. And that is why her role is known as Gloriana, is very successful. So Elizabeth had these four early threats and she deals with all of them in different ways. How successfully she deals with them, that's for your job as a historian to balance and weigh up.